senator for District 3 here in Northwest Indiana. That's Gary Merrillville Hobart, Crown Point, Lake Station, and New Chicago. And today we are excited. We are giving you guys a preview of some of the uh, tools and resources that the Small Business Administration has in terms of the CARES Act that has passed recently in Congress. Uh, first off, I want to say thank you and acknowledge all of the healthcare workers and professionals and all those on the front line that's addressing this pandemic. Thoughts and prayers are those, out to those that are struggling and have family members that are struggling with COVID-19. Uh, again, I wanna just thank our speakers today. We have Ashley Bell, which is a White House policy advisor, also a regional director with the Small Business Administration. Uh, we have Brandon Comer, of CEO of Comer Capital. And very briefly, I wanted to give an overview of their background. I'll turn it over to Ashley, and the next person after Ashley will be uh, Brandon that will be speaking before us. So a little bit about Ashley Bell. Ashley was appointed on February 21st, 2018 by the White House to serve as regional administrator for the U.S. Small Business Administration for Region 5, serving nine districts located in the eight southeastern states of Alabama, Florida, Georgia, Kentucky, Mississippi, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Tennessee. Uh, Regional Administrator Bill also has oversight over $5 billion in SBA-backed lending, the counseling arm of the SBA, which counseled over 225,000 entrepreneurs last year in Region 5, and the contracting programs for small business programs, which account over 23% of all federal contracts awarded. After Ashley will be speaking, uh, Brandon Comer. Brandon is the managing partner of Comer Capital Group, one of the largest Black-owned independent financial advisory firms in the country. He has advised some of the country's most vital employers, from small business to nonprofits to local governments, and over $2.5 in debt transactions. He has dedicated his career to ensuring minority enterprises have access to the capital market, and also personal overseeing the financial turnarounds for cities of Compton, City of Gary, Benedict College, and other institutions. Brandon is also born and raised in the City of Gary, so I, was, I had to throw that in there, Brandon, just to let the, uh, our listening audience know. <laughs> but before we proceed, and I'll turn it over to Ashley, I wanna just send a special thank you to our partners. I wanna thank the Legacy Fo Foundation, we have uh, Kelly here with the Legacy Foundation. We have Lake Area United Way, who will be joining us soon, uh, with Lisa Doherty. Uh, Urban League of Northwest Indiana, we have Vanessa Ella McLeod on the phone. Uh, and the Gary Chamber of Commerce with Chuck Hughes, and also Deanne Patina with Crossroads Chamber of Commerce. So thank you all for being a partner. You'll hear later on in this presentation from them. But right now, I'd like to turn it over to Ashley Bell. Thank you, Senator. I appreciate your you having me today. This is just a great opportunity. And I really, you know, just for, as a reflection of your leadership and ability to pull together at all levels, community partners, private sector, federal level, uh, state level where you are, uh, everybody together around this common cause, which is how do we all survive this crisis that we're in, but then also how do we rebuild? How do we recover? And this conversation is gonna cover both of those. Like, what do we do now short term and what can we do long term for your businesses? I wanna first start by saying, you know, part of my job as a, the White House Policy Advisor for Entrepreneurship, as well as working with SBA, uh, is, is to promote these sorts of conversations. And so I first off wanna just say thank you for your leadership. Thank you for all the partners for joining us. Thank you everyone who decided to tune in today because especially for you to take time away and to be here today, you know that this information could be helpful to your community, uh, to your businesses, uh, and, and generally to our culture as a, as, as a nation as we rebuild. So SBA, as you know it, has changed. So most things that you understand about SBA, uh, we, we are still that, but SBA is more because this is a national disaster. Before this crisis, SBA served small businesses. That was mostly businesses under 500 employees. Today, we still serve businesses that are under 500 employees. However, we now, also, we now also serve nonprofits that are under 500 employees, churches, synagogues, mosques that are under 500 employees. So an industry, uh, an agency that once served 30 million entities now is close to serving 100 million entities. 
Because when you look at all the businesses, all the churches, every nonprofit, um, many of them qualify for SBA services. So everything that I mentioned to you today, know that those three pillars fall under everything that I'm mentioning. If you have a church, this applies to you. If you have a nonprofit, this applies to you. If you have a small business, this also applies to you equally. That was a change made by uh, the, this administration two Saturdays ago to include churches. First time ever that churches have been able to receive SBA funding. But it's important because, as you know, uh, Eddie, you know, we have a lot of small churches in this country. Uh, you know, small churches that many times have pastors and sometimes have other jobs. They aren't full time. Uh, but those churches don't have online services. They're just now figuring out Zoom like many of us are trying to figure out Zoom. But they aren't in a position to uh, benefit from online giving uh, and, and everything that keeps them running. And it's, it's really important that we continue to offer uh, opportunities for our churches to sustain this as much as we're offering opportunities for businesses. So please share that with your community because I promise you, uh, SBA is not the first thing that will come to your pastor's mind when he's thinking about how do I get past this crisis. Uh, but now it should be. It absolutely should be. So our top two programs that we have at SBA, one is uh, our, our payroll protection program, which I urge everyone to pay very urgent attention to because this program is, has limited resources. Uh, as of today, we've issued over $270 billion in this program. And the program was allocated by Congress through the CARES Act, which is the bipartisan bill that passed 100 to zero in the Senate bipartisan support in the House signed by President Trump. It is funded for 349 billion. So as you can see in the last 12 business days, this program has had extraordinary popularity. The demand in this country, unfortunately, is very high because unemployment is a real and serious threat to our economy. This bill was meant for that. So as I explain this bill, understand what the purpose is for. If you understand the purpose, then what I'm explaining will have some necessary conclusions that you can draw from it. It's to get people off unemployment to take people who aren't getting a paycheck right now because the restaurant closed, because the school is closed, because daycare shut down. All the things that we know require people to touch each other and to be in the same locations is shut down by request of the government at all levels. So this is a government response to say, while you're shutting down, we don't want tens of millions of people to be on unemployment. Let's give them the paycheck that they were already getting for eight weeks, and we will allow every business owner, every nonprofit leader, every pastor to keep their staff for eight weeks without having to actually pay for that because you don't have the revenues coming in. The government will pay for that eight weeks worth of salary with little overhead so that they can be made whole during this time. So knowing that, our program works like this. You have to go to your local bank. This, this loan will be administered through a local lender. Every state is different in which banks are still accepting customers. Uh, you can reach out to sba.gov and you can go to uh, the Indiana uh, SBA office that has a running list of uh, banks that are still accepting applications. But here's, here's the gist of the application. You show SBA, and, and I'll give you the gist because I know we have experts like Brandon Comer who are gonna dive a little deeper a little later. You show the SBA your payroll for a month, the average payroll for a month. We multiply that times 2.5. And let's just say that number's $100,000. So we give you $100,000, $75,000 has, this is in order for this to be forgivable, $75,000 has to be used for payroll, which means you have to put the people back on payroll. And let's just say you do this loan today, you get the loan today for 100,000. You had the choice of keeping the people you have right now, or let's just say after February 15th, you let people go. Say you had 15 employees February 15th, today you have 10. When you go to the bank today, they will give you the option. Do you want to hire back those five that you let go after February 15th and put them back on payroll? You can. You can go back, take them off of unemployment, put them on payroll, and the government will pay everybody's salary, those five and the 10 that you had for eight weeks. All you have to do at the end of the eight weeks is show your lender that you kept everyone on payroll, you did not decrease their salary by more than 25%, and then the entire loan becomes forgivable, forgivable, meaning you do not pay that back. So that's the payroll protection program. 
and it has some limitations. You can't make over a hundred thousand dollars. Sal salary that's over a hundred grand is not calculated into that. You can include overhead such as mortgage interest, rent, utilities, and insurance premiums can be included in that well with the other twenty five thousand. The example I gave you was a hundred thousand, seventy five for employees, twenty five for overhead. Now that is a short term strategy. That is a right now eight week strategy. The other strategies revolves around the EIDL program, that's EIDL, Economic Impact and Disaster Loans. Now that is a program that is dedicated to more of a long-term strategy. It is a loan from SBA with the option to have an advance up to $10,000 if, if you have employees. That's an option for you to get an advance. Advance meaning that you can get $10,000 turned into a grant by SBA if you have employees and the rest of it will become a loan, a low interest loan. And what's important about that is that this loan has two categories, one for for-profits and one for non-profits. The for-profit category is at a 3.75 interest rate. The non-profit category is at a 2.75 interest rate. That's important because it's really hard for non-profits and for-profits alike, especially small businesses who have a need for working capital, to go into a bank and tell a bank that they need working capital and they get a low interest 3.75 or 2.75 loan with these terms. These terms are very, very generous. These terms include one, you don't have to start paying back the loan until one year from the note. So if you get a $25,000 loan today, your first payment on that note isn't until April 15th, April 14th, 2021. So it gives you a year, time to recover, time to grow, time to build. That's why this is a long-term strategy. This loan also says that if you have an SBA loan that is currently uh, out there, that loan with any of our programs can be, kicked, uh, can be paid for by SBA principal and interest for the next six months. So if you have an existing loan with SBA, we'll pay the interest and principal for six months. Um, what's also great about this loan is that for the first $25,000, there's no collateral requirement. And also there's no personal guarantee requirement. That's an outstanding way for you to get access to capital for today so you can build for tomorrow. These two programs work well together. I think you'll hear more from Mr. Comer about how they can and how they could be beneficial to each other. You can use both programs. So I hope that you don't uh, hear this as a way of saying, well, which program is best for me? They both could be, and more than likely they both should be used together. So with that, Senator, I'll pass it back to you so uh, Mr. Comer can dig a little bit deeper into the details. Thank you, Ashley. For those that have joined in, we have about uh, 50 plus members that have joined in today. So thank you all for joining. We just heard from Ashley Bell, uh, which is a White House policy advisor, also regional uh, associate with the Small Business Administration. Uh, we're gonna have some questions that come in. Feel free to join us in the chat area, post your questions. If we have time at the end of this session, we'll uh, give time for question and answers in a live format. So with that being said, I wanna turn it over to Brandon Comer, CEO of Comer Capital. Okay, thank you, Senator, and thank you, Ashley, for the overview. Uh, as Ashley mentioned, you know, we really prompt businesses to take a step back and look at these programs from a holistic point of view. Um, how can you utilize these tools uh, to not only help you through this pandemic, but to also position your business uh, for success post-pandemic? So the PPP program, with its forgivability function, uh, it's definitely something if you have W-2 employees, uh, you should probably be taking advantage of. And as Ashley mentioned, there are limited funds. Um, so you definitely want to move as expeditiously as possible and either contact your lender, uh, the SBA directly, or work with a financial professional to assist you. Um, but given the fact that you can utilize those funds to pay employee payroll, as well as some critical expenses, and it'll be forgiven, uh, we certainly don't see a reason why uh, businesses would not engage in that program. But make sure that your employees are W-2 employees. At the beginning, uh, uh, immediately post-implementation of the legislation, there was a thought that you could use it for 1099 contractors. Uh, however, you cannot, uh, as those contractors are probably eligible to apply for themselves. So if you have your payroll uh, tax reports, or if you use a payroll provider like ADP, make sure you have all of that information when you go to your lender uh, and you fill out the application to look at what two and a half times that average monthly payroll is. 
and that will determine the amount that you can um, that you can receive. We also urge you to make sure that you maintain those payroll records during that eight week period uh, because your loan being forgiven will be predicated on the on the lending institution being able to verify you use the funds for the stated purpose. Um, so make sure you keep those payroll records to demonstrate that you used at least 75% of those funds for payroll so that that entire amount can be forgiven. Now on the idle side, um, you know, this is really a great opportunity for businesses to access a low interest loan uh, for working capital purposes. You know, for a lot of our small businesses to be able to take working capital and extend it out over a 30 year period because the idle loan can be uh, extended out for a term up to 30 years. The thought there being the federal government recognizes that the same expenses, operating expenses you had pre pandemic, you will have post pandemic, uh, except now you will also have the expense of debt service on the amount of money that you borrow to get you through here, uh, through, this, through this crisis. And so they're allowing you to stretch it out for a longer period of time to keep those payments low. Um, something to consider there, obviously, the longer you stretch that out, the more interest you'll pay over time. But given that it's a low interest rate, um, you know, that's something that's still worth stretching out to keep the payments low for cash flow purposes. So we're encouraging businesses to approach this and not only seek the capital from, for idle that you need for eight weeks or whatever period of time that you think uh, you know, revenues or might be down, but to really look at this as a tool for what capital your business needs to survive and thrive post pandemic. Um, we certainly don't encourage people to borrow more than they need, but, but be cognizant of the fact that there are no prepayment expenses tied to the idle loan. Uh, so make sure you borrow sufficient funds that your, that your uh, business would need. There is a third program that we want to mention, uh, which is the Express Bridge Loan Program. So if your current lender is an express lender with the SBA and you are a customer of that bank uh, as of February the 15th, then you are eligible to borrow up to $25,000 unsecured in anticipation of your idle loan being approved. So this is just a bridge loan uh, until your idle loan is approved because the idle loan goes through directly through the SBA. As Ashley mentioned before, the PPP goes through a bank, but given that the idle loan goes through the SBA, and a lot of people may have already filled out that online application and said, well, I've got my application in, you know, I'm waiting to <laughs> receive some funds. And I want people to be cognizant that that was really the beginning of a bifurcated process. So you received an application number, but there's still gonna be a request for additional information, right? So I'm encouraging everyone to get your tax returns together, um, have a profit and loss uh, and, and a statement and a balance sheet for 2019, because a lot of people have not filed tax returns for 2019. So you'll need to have that interim financial data for 2019, have your year date uh, 2020 financial information together because once that request for information comes out from the SBA you have about seven days to turn that information around so you don't want to start trying to compile that information after you receive the request when on the front end we know you'll probably be asked to to provide that and furnish that information so um, and, and, and as with any loan having a complete package uh, will not only increase the, the probability of the loan being funded, but it will also decrease the turnaround time from when you have to continue to provide information and when you can uh, receive funds. So again, if, you're, if your bank is an express SBA lender, uh, you go ahead and make an application with them. You can get up to the 25000 And then once your idle loan is approved, then the proceeds from the idle loan will be used to pay off the bridge loan. So in the example, if you get a $100,000 idle, if you got a $25,000 bridge loan, uh, $25,000 from your $100,000 idle will pay off the bridge loan, and then you would have the $75,000 remaining. Another important point for the PPP is if you, are, if you don't 
maintain compliance with the 7525 rule, anything that is not forgiven uh, becomes a loan that is repayable over a period of two years at a 1% interest rate. Um, now that is a low interest rate. And so one of the other things we are we're prompting as you're looking at both of these products um, in concert is shift whatever you can onto the PPP side. Shift as much as you can onto the free money side before utilizing uh, what you have to pay back at 3.75% interest if you're a for-profit business. So these programs can seem a little daunting. Um, so we definitely encourage people, if you have the opportunity to work with a professional, but with, more importantly, we wanna get this information out because they have volume caps for both programs. And we wanna make sure that all of you have the opportunity uh, to access these funds in the event that they, you know, before they become unavailable. So it's not something that we can sit around on. Um, so we're really hoping that people take advantage of this as quickly as possible. And so with that, Senator Melton, uh, I'll turn it back over to you. All right, thank you, Brandon. Um, I just wanna remind folks, if you have questions, feel free to input your questions in the Q&A uh, below. Um, very quickly, I, I just wanna make sure that folks realize that once we continue with this or complete this, that uh, where we receive this information, we wanna make sure that this is recorded and provided on a platform for you to go back and listen to. I know some folks may have joined a little bit later. Uh, so with that being said, I wanna just give a, a, an opportunity for our partners to say a few words, if you have any recommendations or any other programs that you wanna share with our listening audience today. Uh, let's start with uh, Kelly, they know with Legacy Foundation. Kelly, uh, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for your support. And you have any words for our listening audience today? Yeah, um, well, thank you for hosting and uh, thank you for everyone for joining. Um, this is something, this is a very important uh, opportunity for our local small businesses, nonprofits to take advantage of, um, especially, you know, considering the impact that uh, this is going to have on all of us for um, the months, years to come. And so we want to make sure that, uh, you know, we spread this information, um, provide the educational resources and access to the information that everybody needs in order to be able to take advantage of this opportunity um, through the SBA. Uh, so Legacy Foundation has uh, made available some technical assistance grants for small businesses, nonprofits, and churches who want to apply for um, any of the SBA uh, or state or federal um, relief assistance that's available currently. Um, so I know for some of the businesses and organizations uh, who might have an accountant on staff or financial staff, um, they're able to pull all the documents together, get the application submitted, work with their bank. Um, but for some of the smaller businesses, that's more difficult and you're having to um, on top of already, you know, feeling this financial impact now having to hire a CPA or an attorney to help you get the application together. And so through Legacy Foundation's assistance, uh, we're helping uh, cover those costs as well so that we make sure that everybody, there's no barriers to taking advantage of this. And so you can find the information at uh, LegacyFDN.org. All right, thank you so much. Uh, Deanna, you want to share a little bit or any thoughts uh, from a Crossroad Chamber perspective? Yeah, um, thank you, uh, Senator Melton, so much for having us today. We uh, appreciate you allowing us to partner with you on this as this is very valuable information for our members, uh, seeing that we do have so many small business members in addition to a lot of nonprofit organizations as well. So we will be this, we have several links on our website to these information to the SBA loan. So uh, members can go there or anyone can go to our, our website and click on these links to get additional information. And, you know, we're just constantly trying to communicate uh, specials and promotions to help our small businesses uh, receive some type of value in this time of need. So once again, we appreciate being here and please refer to the chamber for anything you need. Great, thank you. And I see we have Andrea with uh, Lake Erie United Way. Andrea, thank you for joining us today. You wanna share any 
remarks from your organization? Sure, thank you so much, Senator Melton, and, and thanks for inviting us to be a partner with you on this as well. I just have a, a message for um, small business owners um, that are um, worried about caring about your employees, your team members who are working right alongside of you. Um, I want to share that we have some resources available. We have an online resource directory. Um, that you can use that your um, employees who may be struggling right now can use. Um, it's, it's at www.resourceroundup.com. Um, and there's everything on there from food assistance to financial assistance um, for those individuals. So we really do wanna wrap around our small business friends um, and help them take care of the employees um, that take care of their business. Great. And uh, uh, Vanessa Alan McLeod with the Urban League of Northwest Indiana, I believe you're on the line as well. Are you on mute, Vanessa? Doesn't look like she's muted. All right. I know she joined on via phone. Uh, right now, I'll turn it back over to uh, Brandon, if you have any closing remarks from uh, Comer Capital, and after Brandon, we'll ask Ashley if he wants to have any closing remarks. Uh, thanks, Senator Melton. Uh, real quick, I do see that we have a question uh, in the chat. Okay. And that question says, I have, a, I have a question about the language on the application for the Paycheck Protection Program as an independent contractor, how do I answer the first question under certifications? Uh, they say payroll, taxes, and salary. Uh, my business is not set up to pay those. Um, so I'll ask Ashley Bell um, if you want to address an independent contractor that is not paying payroll taxes. Uh, yes, yeah, thank you for that for that question. It is a very common question. We just released actually the rules, uh, which I can share with the center and folks on this call, the interim rule, uh, final rule for independent contractors and sole proprietors. Both are treated the same. So essentially on your taxes, when you include your income, your 1099s, obviously you're able to itemize and whether you have a, a 1040 or Schedule C, uh, your net amount that you have after you've written off everything, that, that gross income amount, uh, that is what will be used as your salary. So when you go to the bank and you apply for the PPP program, they'll need to see your taxes, they'll need to see your 1099s, but ultimately they'll look at your taxes, taxes and look at the net amount uh, from the line of your taxes when you subtract all your expenses and that'll be what they will base your income and eligibility off of. Great. Any other questions, Brandon, that may have come up? No, I think, the, well, the, the, the question, the other only other question that came up, uh, I believe Ashley just addressed in that response. Great. It looks like we may have a few more minutes, Brandon. I don't know if we want to open it up for any live questions uh, at this time. Okay, we're going to open everyone's line uh, and we ask that you just unmute yourself to ask your question. Although we do have one that just came in the chat. It asks, are there, are the employer portion of the employee tax deductions included in the 75% of the total payroll? Ashley, if you want to answer that one. Uh, yes, they are. All right. Good stuff. Like Brandon mentioned, ladies and gentlemen, uh, they're opening up the line now for folks that may have questions. Uh, Brandon, do they need to prompt themselves if they have a question or anything like that so we can kind of do this in an orderly fashion or uh, just kind of as we go? They can raise the, they can raise their hand and then we can uh, un unmute them. Okay. Uh, but one more question just came in the chat as well. Uh, it says that the one page documents that make it simple for people to understand or do that can be distributed to people. I believe the question is, is there a one page document that kind of is for you? Um, and we do have uh, a deck that, that outlines what has been discussed on this call and what we can do is share that presentation 
uh, with the panelists or the group that are represented and they can distribute it out to, to, the, to the members or participants. Um, okay, and, and I'm going to All right, uh, looks like Robbie, you may have a, had a question. I do, can you hear me? Yes. Great, so I'm having a hard time finding someone to give me the answer to what criteria we need to follow to make sure we're within the guidelines during the eight weeks. For example, I had 18 employees last year, now I'm down to maybe 14. They're working as many hours as the 18 worked because I have mostly part-time employees. So what, what are the guidelines? Do I have to have 18 employees working for this eight week period? Do you see what I'm saying? Do you, do you get what I'm saying? There are yeah, I, I, I get it. Do you want to answer that, Brandon? Oh, Okay, that's that's a great question. Uh, the answer to your question is that that's up to you. Uh, when you go to your bank and you apply for the PPP program, um, you can choose to go with the number of employees you have right now, or you can choose to go with the number of employees you had at that time. It's, it's really a number of employees deal, not necessarily uh, the rate. The only, the only thing that, that can be affected is you can't drop the rate during that eight weeks that you choose to go with let's say you go with employees you have right now this is going to cover the next eight weeks you cannot drop their salary or their wages by more than 25 percent during that time so we're going to take the average salary that you have for one month and you can you know let's just say you know they're going to look at either 20 two windows are either going to look at either going to look at 2019 uh february sometime between february and june and do an average or they're going to look at January of 2020 to the February 29th of 2020, one of the two windows, whichever one is the most advantageous for you, you can pick. And when you pick whichever month, um, you just have to tell them at the outset, 10 days after funding, how many employees you're going to keep. What they're going to ask is at the end of the eight weeks, how many employees do you have? If that number matches the number you have from the beginning, if the payroll amounts have not deviated more than 25%, if the ratio is only 75% of the total loan is going towards um, employees and the 25 towards acceptable overhead, then it's forgiven. Great. Thanks, Ashley, for that response. Uh, I see we have a question from Richard Leverett that asks, is the first $10,000 of the IDLE program still a grant or did that change? Uh, it can it can be, but the ten thousand dollars, you know, it's not an automatic ten thousand dollars. The the criteria for the initial ten thousand dollars is for are for employees with over ten employers with over ten employees. So if you have over ten employees, and you apply for that grant and you're awarded that grant, then yes, you do not have to pay that advance back. If you don't have ten thousand, I mean, don't have ten employees, then you're going to get some some amount less than that if something at all. Great. Hey Brent, very quickly, I wanted to give another one of our partners that's on the line an opportunity to chime in. We have Mr. Chuck Hughes with the Gary Chamber of Commerce. I believe Chuck, are you still on the line? Hello, Chuck. You might be uh, still muted. We'll, we'll come back to that portion of it. Brandon, uh, do we have any more questions that's come on uh, in, in the chat? We do. Um, this question from Jocelyn Kelly, using the PPP, what are the repayment terms for the remaining balance after the forgiven amount is deducted? Uh, the repayment terms would be uh, two years at 1%. Um, and then the next question was, what happens if you receive the SBA advance, but have not received any communication or update on the status of idle. Uh, what are suggested next steps? And Ash, I'll let you get to that part. Uh, so the first question, that, that's exactly right, Brandon, and you, you gave that exact answer. Uh, the only other term I want to just remind folks of is that you do have the ability to defer that payment for six months. So don't feel like if you go over and you have that loan amount, you have to pay it right then. You do get six months 
Uh, and that can be increased if necessary, if you can show reason before you start paying that back. If you, if you have received the idle advance, uh, that's great. Now, you should receive an email in the next two to three days from SBA uh, scheduling you a time to speak with someone to talk about what your total amount will be. SBA is currently working on what that is going to look like. The demand for this program was so high that there has to be some reconciliation um, with SBA and the Secretary of the Treasury relating to how many people want uh, an IDA loan and in what amounts versus what Congress has appropriated. So once that reconciliation has happened, then you will see clarity in what the terms of the rest of your loan could be or would be going forward. Thanks, thanks, Ashley. Um, the next question comes from Corey Brown. It says, what has been the typical turnaround time for the PPP and idle funds? I know several people have filled out both, but no one's actually received any funds. Uh, I'll speak to the PPP and then Ashley, if you could speak to idle. Um, so as we stated before, a lot of banks were inundated with a large influx of applications for the PPP. So a lot of them were taking in the applications, um, you know, and even getting some approvals. Uh, and whereas a lot of you know, large, the larger banks, they stopped taking applications. And some of the community banks had some questions that the SBA worked through as it relates to, uh, you know, balance sheet and back-end authorizations before the loans were dispersed. Um, we are aware of, that of, of clients and other folks that have received funding at this point on the PPP side. So uh, those funds are starting to be dispersed. Uh, we would encourage you to stay in contact with your lender. Um, and, then, and again, the funds are limited. So we would encourage if you have a main application uh, to do that as quickly as possible. Um, but again, that is a lender driven process. So a lot of loans, if you are an existing customer, may have been given priority to that bank's existing customers versus people who are not customers and just made an application through that particular institution. Uh, and then actually, if you can explain the idle process. Well, I, I think as you heard from the prior question, there are people who have received the idle loan uh, cash in the account on the advance uh, and some are waiting direction on the remainder of their loan. And, and so, um, you know, we've had tens of millions of dollars in idle advance money that's been spent out. Uh, PPP loans, some were funded same day. Um, I think as Mr. Comer said, the PPP loan is gonna be contingent on the bank that you use. Some banks are quicker than others, just like the normal marketplace. Uh, some banks can get money in your hand quicker than others. So I think that the banks you use are very important as far as how quickly that is funded. As far as the idle loan is concerned, advances have been given out to many people already. The final amount is yet to be determined because the Treasury uh, has to look at the total amount that has been requested from American small businesses, nonprofits, and churches. And out of that amount, uh, they have to figure out what is the actual pot of money this is going to come from. What is the total amount? So once that number is reconciled and whether or not that has to go to Congress to fulfill the amount, but obviously from calls like this, and I know from talking to your friends, families, and neighbors, the demand is extraordinarily high. And so once the, that has been reconciled, then you'll have more information back in the next today or in the, sometime this week from SBA on the idle loan, determining uh, what amount will be able to be funded. Brad, I, I do have a question very quickly. Um, and this may be for you or Ashley. Have there been any reasons specifically where entities have been denied? And what are some examples of how folks have been denied uh, if there's been documentation or anything like that that has caused that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there, there are some reasons. Obviously, um, the number one reason people have been denied is for lack of filling out appropriate applications and, and fulfilling their needs uh, of properly documenting their need for the loan. So I think it's important to you know, have a conversation with the, your, your accountant, have a conversation with people like Mr. Comer to make sure that you have uh, putting your best shot forward to, to get an application approved. Great, thank you. Any more questions, Brandon? Uh, no, we do not have any additional questions at this time. All right, looks like we have about 10 or 15 minutes remaining. I don't know if we wanna open up just for a couple more questions 
then uh, we can do some closing remarks. Okay, yeah, if anyone has an, an additional question, please raise your hand. Well, Senator, I want to just give quick closing remarks. I have to jump off just a little early before the next one. Uh, I just want to, again, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to your constituents today. This extraordinary opportunity. It speaks to your leadership. Uh, I know that uh, you have great experts to come on often. I'm glad to be one of them. And anything you need uh, from the White House or otherwise, that we can be supportive of you and your leadership, please let me know. Thank you so much. And uh, we'll definitely be in touch and talk to you soon. Yes, sir. All right. All right, uh, Brandon, do you uh, have any closing thoughts or remarks before we chime off? Or Actually, let me see if Vanessa uh, or Chuck, if you're able to jump in very quickly, if you are not having any technical difficulties. Any one of you there? All right, well, Brandon, I'll turn it back over to you. Okay, uh, and we did have one final question come in mm -hmm. to ask how does the PPP program apply to a startup business uh, less than three months in business. Uh, the the date that's important to remember is February 15th. Uh, so if you are in service uh, at that date, you can be eligible. Um, if you had employees, if you already started uh, playing pay, paying payroll, so I would just work with your lender. But if you were in business three months, uh, then you should have been in service at that requisite date. So then it's just a matter of what, how the calculation applies to you based on the payroll you had at that time. Okay, and that was, that was the final question. So um, yeah, I would just like to, again, thank you, Senator Melton, uh, and thank you to all of the partners on getting this very vital information you know, out to the region. Um, again, I cannot urge you to try and act as quickly as possible. Um, it's important that businesses act smart and swift uh, in order to take advantage of these opportunities. Uh, and knowledge is power. So thank you for helping to get this information out. And we are here to help service the community. If there are any additional questions, we'll provide all of our contact information. Uh, but we wanna make sure that as many businesses as this is applicable to have access to, the, to this much needed capital in conjunction with the programs that the other partners are providing. So thank you again. Great, thank you. I just want to reiterate that we will have another session at noon. Uh, if you missed a significant portion of this one, feel free to join us back at noon Central Standard Time. Also, feel free to share this information with folks uh, and invite them so they can listen in if they can benefit from this. Uh, in closing, for myself, uh, State Senator in District 3, I wanted to make sure that we make this information as available as possible uh, and provide all the knowledge. I know there's been a lot of questions and a lot of concerns on how to access these resources. So I wanted to call on the professionals uh, to provide accurate information. And I wanna thank again our partners. I wanna thank the Gary Chamber of Commerce, the Crossroad Chamber of Commerce, the Legacy Foundation, Lake Area United Way, uh, and the Urban League of Northwest Indiana. And again, Everyone remains safe. We'll get through this together. Uh, and also make sure that you continue to stay tuned with your partners that's here to learn more about what's going on in days to come. All right, thank you so much and have a great day.